Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mustafa Kamal, CEO of Prime and Magellan RX, and uh, excited to welcome you all to our latest episode of Beyond the Script, where today we're going to be talking about uh, the all things in DC and the politics and state of play for uh, drug pricing, drug uh, channels, and uh, pharmacy related issues. And I have with me today the distinct pleasure of uh, J.C. Scott and David Root joining us. I'll ask them to uh, introduce themselves in just a minute. Uh, but I also, for all of our um, our listeners today, first of all, thank you very much for joining and for, st uh, for, for continuing to support our Beyond the Script series. Uh, but also just a reminder to put your questions into the question, the Q&A box, and we'll be sure to, uh, to take your questions as we go along over the course of our broadcast today. So, with that, JC, why don't you take a few minutes to uh, to introduce yourself? Mustafa, thanks so much for having me on. David, great to see you as always. As Mustafa said, I'm JC Scott. I'm the president and CEO of PCMA, the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association. We are the trade association representing pharmacy benefit companies. We are thrilled to have Mustafa as a member of our board and Prime Therapeutics as a member of the association. Uh, and it's a really exciting time to be a part of this industry and this organization. We've got about 73 PBMs operating in the United States today. We've seen about 10% growth in the market in just the last two years. Uh, so a lot of dy dynamism and evolution happening in the industry, which makes it really cool to be at the association right now. So thanks for having me on. Oh, thank you for joining us, JC. And it just uh, hats off to you and your team. Your leadership of PCMA has been fantastic and the team has done an amazing job. And it's interesting. It's a, a little known fact that there are so many PBMs out there. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, David, uh, why don't you take a few minutes to introduce yourself uh, to, to our audience? Sure. Thank you. It's, it's good to be here. Um, appreciate it. Uh, I've been uh, with Prime for 11 years. I run the state and federal government affairs program. Prior to coming into Prime, I uh, was a state lobbyist for Medco Health Solutions, so going way back. And I actually did the math this morning, and it was rather depressing, but I've been working in government or with government for the last 30 years. So um, uh, at both the state and the federal level. And so this is a, a, this is a good opportunity for us to, to talk a little bit about the, the state of play. And there's a lot of things happening at both the state and the federal level. I think uh, everyone should uh, get quite a bit of information out of this. And, and David, it, uh, it speaks to your expertise your re and your resolve that you've been doing this for so long, but you've been a great asset to our organization and all the experience that you bring. And for those of you who've been around PBM for, for quite some time, I'm sure you know David, and uh, and in, in some way, shape or form, it's seemingly all paths lead through the old Medco organization. So it's it's uh, it's uh, good to uh, to acknowledge that for sure. So as we just, um, you know, get, get going here, I wanna lay, lay a little bit of groundwork for our viewers around just the state of play. What's the framework around all the conversations that you're hearing in both DC and in the state capitals around drug pricing. What's top of mind? What's driving you know, a lot of the noise and, and uh, some very legitimate policy considerations, some rhetoric. If you could just share a perspective for our viewers as to what's happening right now. And JC, we'll start with you in DC. Yeah, I'm happy to kick it off. And I'll, I will talk about what's happening here in particular with Congress. And I'll, maybe to state the obvious for anyone who hasn't been paying attention, but it really is sort of an unprecedented level of activity around pharmacy benefit issues at the beginning of this year. We've seen about 12 hearings over the course of six months, uh, which is kind of unlike anything I've seen in my, uh, David, I'm, I'm not quite at 30 years, but in my 25 years here in, working, working in Washington in my about four and a half years here at PCMA. And so the question is why, right? Why are we seeing this activity? And part of it, big picture is that Drug pricing remains good politics for members of Congress in terms of a, a good consumer friendly populist issue to focus on. This year, the focus is on PBMs. And what does that mean? It means we're seeing proposals related to transparency and reporting, proposals to limit the way that the ways that clients can contract with and re reimburse PBMs for their services, mandating how pharmacy benefit companies work with pharmacies, how much pharmacies should be paid. Unfortunately, just a lot of proposals that I would say don't actually solve for the question of patient need when it comes to drug affordability and access. 
And to some degree, Mustafa, Congress is kind of taking the bait that's being thrown out by other stakeholders who don't want to be at the table for the public policy discussion. So that means some of what we've seen may scratch a short term political itch, but it isn't really going to solve for those issues of list prices and patient out of pocket costs and benefit design and affordability of benefits. You know, the things that we would say are probably need to be a part of that dialogue. Still a long way to go. Much of the legislation is tied up in bigger politics between the Democratic controlled Senate and the Republican controlled House, both of which have their own policy priorities and competing political agendas. Someone may ask us to predict how this all shakes out this year. I don't have a great prediction for you at this state, but our hope is through the association that we can inform the policy discussion, help policymakers figure out what they want to solve for when it comes to drug affordability and work with them on solutions that are gonna inject more competition into the market, create more options for patients and providers, and importantly, preserve the ability of employers and plan sponsors to offer affordable benefits. And that's that's part of the problem here, right? Some of these policies are just fundamentally misdirected because they're looking at pharmacy benefits and pharmacy benefit companies when in fact, our companies are the ones who are helping to deliver that affordability. Yeah, that, that's really insightful perspective, JC. And I think the you know, the point you made uh, really resonates. The reality is there is there is an affordability issue for many people on Main Street related to their, the, their chronic conditions, the drug pricing, and what they're faced with at the counter. And the, the biggest concern that we all have is, you know, ensuring that any policy considerations actually solve the problem and don't either create more issues or have unintended consequences, which is a, a very astute point. David, as you think about it, maybe from the state perspective, you know, are, are you, uh, give us a, a perspective as to what that looks like, what's similar or different from what JC shared and, um, and how do you see it going forward? Sure, I think JC was spot on at the state level. We're facing a lot of the, the same issues. We're experiencing a lot of the same debate. Um, it's just happening a lot faster at the state level. Um, I, I would say that there's one added layer there at the state level, and that is this level of legislative frustration. And that frustration stems from the constraints that state legislative, legislative bodies have uh, between the ERISA law and the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, state legislators are very limited in how they can impact, how they can have an Im impact on requiring manufacturers to lower a drug's list price or getting at the root of the problem, right, which is the list price. The net result of that, again, is exactly how JC put it. We end up with a lot of legislation that has unintended consequences. A lot of those unintended consequences are actually end up driving up the cost, the very thing that they initially, initially said they wanted the legislation to reduce is the cost. And in the end, it, it ends up increasing not only the cost for the benefit, uh, for the benefit sponsor, but for the individual and the consumer at the counter. So our objective is to really get them to understand the, the core root of the problem and, and how you know, what, what understanding what the constraints are and how they can address that. Yeah. And it's really important work. It's not easy to do. You know, as I, as I reflect on the time I've spent with uh, members of Congress, senators at state level uh, lawmakers, uh, it's always surprising to me in the conversations, how much misinformation is out there about how the benefit works, what PBMs actually do. And, and, and you both have spent a lot of time in those environments. I, I'd be curious to hear uh, from you, JC, and, and then David, you know, as you think about what's most misunderstood about our industry and about PBMs, what's, what stands out in your mind? How much time you got, Mustafa? Yeah, <laughs> about two minutes. <laughs> about two minutes, all right. No, your, your point, the point of your question is exactly right, because at, some, at, at, at many points, it feels the fundamental role and value of what our companies do is misunderstood. Right. We all experience that our companies do a lot of important things to provide clinical services, to help keep people on their medications, to make our experience at the pharmacy happen seamlessly. That's not seen and understood among policymakers. And at a very basic level, what is misunderstood or maybe undervalued is what we do to empower employers with savings and choices on how to use those savings so that they can offer affordable benefits to the patients that they represent. Ultimately, our company's job is to drive down costs, to drive affordability, and at the end of all of that is the patient. 
who benefits because the plan sponsor, the employer is able to offer coverage and able to offer good, affordable coverage and benefits. So preserving our ability to offer to deliver savings, preserving the ability of employers to choose how to design their benefits to best meet the needs of the people they represent. That's really a key principle that's not well represented and not well understood in the public policy discussion, because I think policymakers aren't realizing that if you take choice out of the system, if you limit how employers and others can work with pharmacy benefit companies, taking that choice away is not going to lower cost. To David's point, it may actually have the opposite of the intended effect and limit the ability to control cost and just make it harder to, to offer affordable benefits. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I, I think that's where where you know, smart uh, policy is informed by a good foundational understanding of how the the industry works and the dynamics. And that's always uh, not always uh, very clear when folks are making these recommendations. David, what's your perspective on this? What's most misunderstood about our industry? Oh, I think you, you touched on it with that foundational understandings. From our perspective, there's really two key foundational understandings. And I'll go through them sort of quickly. And the first one is really simple. Not all PBMs are the same. As we've already heard, there's some 70 PBMs competing via the RFP process. And that RFP process is that second foundational understanding. At, at Prime, we prioritize alignment with our customers' goals. Uh, we're, we're not constrained by the need to drive profits. Uh, as some of our publicly traded models might be, but that's just that's not good. It's not bad. It's just a different model there. The, and then you want to talk about the RFP process, which is which is critical to the understanding of this whole process, the, the relationship between the PBMs and, and a benefit sponsor. The RFP process is the start of that benefit sponsor relationship with their PBM. It, the, the, benefit, the benefit sponsor puts down on paper exactly what they want from formulary design to the breadth of the network to how the benefit is even going to be paid for. Uh, the benefit sponsor is in total control over every detail of what goes into creating that benefit book. And the, they're in total control of how it will be used for their customers or employees. So the idea that the PBM sort of knocks on the on the door of the employer and says, hey, I'd like to sell you a product and this is all you get to pick from, that that is just foundationally incorrect. Um, we are a vendor to those uh, to employers, labor unions, governments um, and health plans. And we we administer the benefit that they design and to be the best of benefit that their employees can afford and, and can have and, and can make work. Um, it's not the PBM driving that decision. It's the benefit sponsor, the employer, the health plan, uh, the government program group. And I think you, in order to try to begin to legislate anything for us at the state level, it's very important to try to get people to understand those that those two things that are sort of the genesis of everything starts from those two assumptions. And you've got to get those right. And often we're finding that it's very difficult to get people to understand that. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, uh, David, as as we think about uh, the two really two key uh, themes there. One is it's a partnership with the benefit sponsors and we design and customize. I think we, we've we got a, a dozens and dozens of flavors of things that we've created over the years as an industry to support the needs of our plant sponsors and to really help employers stay in the business of providing benefits. But also your really astute observation, having worked for a big publicly traded PBM and a small PBM that was a disruptor looking to compete and now prime, you know, I've had the privilege over the last 17 years to work at three different PBM organizations and they all have different business models, different value propositions. And to the point you made, there are 73 PBMs out there that all have different approaches to how to deliver these benefits and employers ultimately have choice. And it's, it's so critical for us to preserve that choice. Yeah, and, and Mustafa, I, I almost want to amend my answer after hearing what David just said yeah. and what you, you just sort of restated. And we, we think about the word innovation when it comes to pharmaceutical manufacturers, and as we should, right? They do incredible things in innovating new medicines and treatments that we're trying to provide patients access to. But innovation applies to our industry as well, 
right? We see this growth, this 10% growth in the number of competitors in our market because they are finding niches to innovate and offer new ways to do the, the work of, of pharmacy benefit. To the extent that the marketplace is saying, we want something different, Congress doesn't have to step in to say, okay, this is how the market should work. The market is solving for those needs. Through that innovation, people are, you know, employers and others are able to switch and move to different models, different contract options, different life levels of data and reporting and service. Uh, and it's it's one of those things that I think is missing from the public policy debate that uh, they're still catching up to. The market is addressing many of the evolutions that are being required. Yeah, it's a great point. And and I've got one more question for for you both, and then we'll we'll turn to the audience questions and see if we could have enough time to take one or two of those. So again, just encourage you to keep your questions coming and uh, put them in the chat box and, and we'll we'll do our best to get to a, a couple of those. But, you know, one of the things that has um, you, you know, come up in many of my conversations uh, around this is, look, you know, like the lawmakers, senators, Congress people, they'll say, look, you come in here, you say it's their fault. Uh, pharma comes in here, says it's the PBM. The pharmacies come in and say such and such. And so there's a lot of um, finger pointing going on, but the reality is we do have a, an issue of affordability in the country. And, and there are, uh, the, the question is, are there real solutions and things that we can embrace to drive material change? And so as you, as you think about all the discussions that you've had, what are some areas that you know, we can focus our energy on as an industry uh, where either we've already done it and we've done some great things that aren't recognized or other areas where we can continue to evolve and innovate to, to start to provide proactive solutions to the, to the affordability and, and the uh, friction equation that patients are often faced with. And JC, I'll, I'll toss that to you first. Yeah, and, and wouldn't it be great if that is the question that was asked at the beginning of every public policy exercise? Because uh, that is the dis debate and discussion that we would we would like to be having instead of the one that's taking place on Capitol Hill. I, I'd identify two areas, Mustafa, both of which go back to the earlier point that the focus has to be on the patient. One is we should be having a conversation as an industry of about how we can better partner with and empower pharmacies to serve patients, right? So if you think about many of our experience during covid being able to go to the pharmacy for, for testing, for vaccination, for some of these other services. And you think about the, in particular in rural areas where there may not be a hospital or doctor nearby, what else could we empower a pharmacy to do under law and regulation to practice at the top of their license and better deliver value to the patient sure. as a site of care? And then the second is, as we work with employers and plan sponsors, using the very important tools that we have for monitoring safety, for the economic tools, for trying to incentivize more affordable choices, making sure those are operating in a 21st century kind of way, right? So as utilization management happens, happening more in real time, in a seamless way with electronic communication back and forth with the provider, that's not to say do away with those tools because they have a ton of value, as I said, for both safety and affordability, but we have to make them work better and reduce that abrasion in the system for the patient and the provider. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. David, your perspectives on that question? Well, there's a, there's a lot of work being done around affordability in the PBM space and, and to the previous conversation around innovation. Uh, I mean, you know, just taking a look at Prime, we're already well underway to creating a sort of next generation of affordable solutions for, for drug prices. We're developing and implementing real-time benefit check tools to help reduce provider and patient friction uh, at the point of service. Um, we have uh, point of sale rebate solutions for clients who are interested in that model. We promote uh, an omni-channel distribution model, uh, focusing on the best place for a consumer to get their medication, uh, as opposed to sort of forcing them into a specific channel or distribution method. And just to JC's point, you know, where the PBMs, Prime included, are exploring ways to enhance the practice of pharmacy at the retail level to help promote more quality access to healthcare for individuals, right? So pharmacies are doing more. We're trying to figure out a way to get them compensated for that and to be able to measure that extra work so that we can factor that into the into the benefit design and, and people can have more access to healthcare, not just having to wait for days or weeks to get into a provider. If, you know, if it's something that they can work on at the pharmacy level. So there's a yeah. lot being done 
Um, and and it, it takes time, um, but it, it's important for policymakers to understand all of the different things that are taking place. This is the one thing, this is not a stagnant industry. We are constantly, every, every one of those 70 PBMs is constantly pushing the envelope to figure out better ways, more enhancements to different programs to create affordability, to create access, um, you know, all the time, because yeah. that's what the customers want. I think it's a, I think it's a great point, and it's so critical for us to acknowledge that we play a role to help improve the overall affordability equation, the experience, and to all the things you pointed out, David. I, they're, they're critical uh, ele design elements for, as an example, for what we're doing here at Prime to respond to the feedback we've gotten from patients, from clients about, hey, be a little better if we had more flexibility here, or if the provider knew uh, which drugs were preferred ahead of time, or a patient understood the cost that they're gonna face at the counter so they're not faced with sticker shock. All of those components are ways in which we can create a better experience. And some of them are in response to feedback, some of them are very proactive. But one of the things that has always been true in my experience in this industry is that it's hyper competitive. And so uh, there's a there's good reason to innovate. There are many good reasons to innovate. The first is it's the right thing to do because we have an awesome responsibility to care for the patients that uh, we take care of. And two, it's good business because it is hyper competitive and we have to stay relevant with competitive, contemporary, competitive uh, and compelling solutions that actually uh, meet and address the needs of the people that we serve. So thank you both for your perspectives on that. We've got a bunch of questions coming through. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to uh, to get to as many as I can here. I'm gonna I'm gonna combine two that I'm seeing in a two part question. Um, the the first part of the question is folks are seeing a lot of anti PBM ads on TV. Can you discuss what's behind the attack coming from the media? I think JC, why don't we just take that one? I think that's a perfect one for you to, to, to tackle. Uh, there, there, there's a couple of different reasons for it, Mustafa. Um, some of it is the naturally the function that, that our companies play in the marketplace is the only actor whose job is to bring down cost. We do create friction with manufacturers and other stakeholders as we are trying to get them to lower their cost. And understandably, they want to be paid more for their products and services. That's an oversimplified version, but that friction in the market can create friction in the public policy space. Some of it is natural politics, as I alluded to at the beginning, that other stakeholders would rather not be the center of attention and therefore encourage Congress to look towards pharmacy benefit companies or different stakeholders to keep themselves sort of off the table and off the menu when it comes to the political debate. But I will say, and I've, you've heard me say this many times, Mustafa, the least favorite part of the job is the rhetorical exchange that we have to take place with when we see these ads from other stakeholders, which requires us to do our own work, to push back, to correct misinformation, to put our voice into the mix, I do not think it's a good use of time and resources for anyone in the prescription drug supply chain. When you sort of have this overarching thread of the government coming in to dictate terms in a marketplace, that's not unique to us. I would love to see us get to a place where pharma, PBM, payer, employer, pharmacy, we can all be sitting around a table together talking about the affordability challenge instead of having this public back and forth through these ads on TV. I, I, I know that my wife is always shocked when we see the ads running. Yes, we watch Jeopardy many nights when we're watching Jeopardy and then the, the pharma ads come on. Yeah, we, we've got a we've got a number of employees that live in, in the D.C. area and, you know, they're inundated with this stuff. And you, you make some really good points, JC. It would be great if we could talk about the issues and stay focused on that. But ultimately, you know, it's a it's a part of the political discourse in this country to have negative ads. I don't know where that started or why it, why it keeps going, but um, you know that's that's the reality behind that. Okay, we've got time for one more question. There's a couple of different uh, thematics that are coming through the questions. I'll try to capture them into you know an overarching question, and it's really around um, employers and our clients. You know, the questions around employers being wary of getting into the fray in this argument and, and, and sort of staying out of the discussion when uh, ultimately, you know, the, the purpose of all the work that we do is to provide affordability so they can continue to deliver benefits. What, what can we do to help change that dynamic and unite 
you know, some of the, uh, the plan sponsors to, to come into the, the conversation. And attached to that, there's a, there's a set of questions related to what can we do to make it more clear to the to stakeholders the all the value that we create, which I think is part and parcel with getting our clients to to share some of their perspectives. David, I'll I'll start with you. Any thoughts on that, and then we'll go to JC. Sure, I, I think really those, like you said, those two questions are really connected, and and you you know when you do one, you work on the other, and we're doing that. We are out. Um, reaching out to employer groups, not just through prime and health plans, but we're doing that through the, our trade association in conjunction with our trade association, setting up um, uh, coalitions of payers. Um, and we spend a tremendous amount of time uh, taking legislation and explaining it to them and explaining the impact to them of what the impact on their benefit is going to look like. And in many cases, we, we'll, we'll use examples that aren't even like, we'll take a group of, of, of benefit sponsors uh, from one particular, say Kansas, and we might use a, a bill in Oklahoma as an example so that we can walk them through the impact to all the different aspects of their benefit. Benefits are very complex. There's the, the, the drug benefit, the medical benefit, and then there's the medical drug benefit aspect of it. And it all gets rolled into one and it can be very confusing and easy to lose track for someone you know, trying to understand the implications of a piece of legislation. We found that, that once we do that, they are more than willing to participate um, in the discussions at the legislative level and, and help us to defend those options and optionality and choice that, that JC talked about being the, the, the core crux of what we're trying to maintain. Uh, so really, it's it's communicating with them in a way that they can understand and just really working with their benefit, uh, the people who design their benefits in their own companies, their HR teams and others, and getting them to understand the implications of each paragraph in the bill. And when we Thank do that, you, they're willing. Thank you, David. And we, we've got 15 seconds, JC. Any Anything to add to what David said? I, I, I couldn't say it any better than David. If everyone can just continue to connect the dots for employers and plan sponsors on the implications of these public policies, I think it'll, it'll enable a, a more productive discussion. Well, thank you both very much. It, uh, these are two of the best individuals in their, in their fields, and it gives me great comfort to know that we have uh, both JC and David sharing perspectives and ensuring that the conversation continues to be as productive as humanly possible. So thank you both very much for joining me. Really appreciate the time. For all of our viewers, thanks for joining us. Um, a reminder, the replay will be online and uh, stay tuned for our next episode of Beyond the